Hello and welcome to Minda Dialogue, episode number 166. This interview is with Violetta Grossi, social media manager at the Grosogono, the luxury jewelry company headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, and founded by her father, Fawaz Grossi. In this podcast, we discuss the novel approach that Di Grosogono has taken as a luxury brand in using digital marketing, social media, and influencer marketing to drive the business. Among luxury brands, they are showing a truly new route. And I'm also happy to announce that I have signed up the inaugural sponsorship of this podcast with the good folks at Tracker. Enjoy the show. the Minter Dialogue podcast, where we discuss brand marketing with a focus on all things digital. I am Minter Dialed, your host and author of The Mindset, that's M-Y-N-D-S-E-T dot com, where branding gets personal. You'll find the show notes to the blog for the upcoming interview. Let's cut to the quick, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Minter Dialogue. So today, someone I met just last week in London, who is working and runs one of the most beautiful luxury brands. Uh, that is called Di Grisogono, as I hopefully say correctly. So, Violetta, tell us who you are and what you do at Di Grisogono. Hello, I'm saying, yeah, my name is Violetta. I um, take care of um, all the social media um, for Di Grisogono, which, um, with the times, our social media has and digital marketing is growing itself. My role has grown. Um, and now we're also doing lots with. Uh, influencer marketing and content strategy is very it's a very exciting time i'm also the um daughter of the founder so um that puts me in a in a, in a nice position in terms of sort of my um loyalty and understanding of of the brand and sort of i've grown up in this in this business so my love and passion and understanding for it is you know is, is quite deep i would say yeah, and at least you represent the brand yeah, in some ways, yeah, I would say yeah, I represent exactly. I represent the brand. And um, so, De Gros was um, started in 1993. Tell us about the origin of the brand, because you know, usually the time when we're talking about luxury, it's sort of since 1857. Uh, but you guys are since 1993. So tell us about the origin and how you've got to this position. Yeah, I mean, we are you know a very young brand. Um, my father um, was in the um, jewelry um, industry from before he he sort of fell into it and fell in love with it um working for sort of high winston and bulgari and um in 93 he decided um with two partners to go it alone and um actually then he continued it only sort of bought them out and continued with the name and he's had sort of a great and an amazing success through his passion and creativity and also boldness i would say he's very brave and sort of just going with you know exactly what he wants, whether others think is crazy or not. And some of those moves have, you know, turned him, you know, the Black Diamond, for example, was one of his first, you know, that was one of the first big pushes that put Dick Rosogano out there. And, you know, him being able to recognise the beauty of the Black Diamond and, you know, mixing that with pearls or, for example, white diamonds, um, which initially was taken, you know, in the industry, he was criticised very much for it, and he still pushed through, and, and now it's actually, you know, his, his Dick Rosogano is, is famous for it, but other brands also use Black Diamonds now, and it's one of the biggest trends in, in, in the junior industry, I would say. Well, so it's been a very brave thing to do, I mean, because if you look at this kind of um, an industry, it feels like there are many great, strong players not only that, but have fairly strongholds on the corners of all these different department stores, and and so how how did you how did they how did you guys find a way through, and get to the size and and the strength and success you have got so far? What do you how how do you put it down to? Um, I mean, I would say obviously I was very young when you know when my father's you know started and. But from from seeing from the very beginning, my father's always had an amazing team of people. So I think that firstly, um, and they've always stuck together. The people at Digger's Organo now that started with him are still, are still there sort of thing. And it was a very small dynamic team. So I, I think that and just such passion and also um, based very much around relationships. My father's extremely sociable. His friends are his clients, his clients, his friends. It's all very much interrelated as well as the people that work with him as well it's all sort of one big family mm. and I think that 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 really helped sort of push and, and keep you know you know it gave something to the brand that other brands didn't have 
to have. Yes, for sure, this notion of the personalization or the personification of the brand, you have that through your father and now with you. Yeah, exactly. And, we're, you know, we're very lucky we're very lucky to have that. And it's, it's very rare to, to, you know, have the founder, you know, his, you know, that Dick Rosogono is my father and, you know, he is the person that, you know, all the creativity or all, all that side of things and actually being able to, you know, even for um, when he, you know, even with the press or with bloggers or whatever, I mean, it's, it's, they, they love being able to talk directly with him and without all these stories. I mean, obviously we have, you know, I mean, the stories are very real, you know, we don't really have to sit and invent stories to give to the press. Give, you know, it's very real. It's, it's what it's you did a, last night. Yeah. And, and give us an idea of the dimension and the size of Digrozagon. I, I mean, how many locations you're in? What what kind of information you tell us to give us an idea of the of how big you guys have become? So we have um, we have 17 boutiques worldwide. Um, you know, we started in Geneva, and then you know, the, the obvious we went from New York, Paris, London, Moscow, St. Bart's. We have you know all the all the main spots, and where I guess our clients are, you know, the most. Um, you know, all the, all the most influential and high end and uh, wealthiest people in the world are really. That's where we are, and then we have um, lots of points of sales as well. That um, it's 150 points of sales in various uh, different uh, different countries, and our head office is in uh, Geneva. So we have um, an office there. Most of our people are there, and a small office in New York with about six people. Uh, we've opened an office now in um, the UAE. Hmm. So in Dubai, we have a small office. So, yeah, we'll quite... Keep growing, the dynamic. Keep growing, yeah. So, I, I, Violeta, I wanted to talk to you about this uh, spirit of de Grosagon. No, this, it, I've read a little bit about it, but this black diamond that weighed, uh, it was reading about 560, 587 carats. How, how, how big is that? Cause, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm pretty clueless. Give us some ideas. That's sort of like two hands full <laughs> Um, I would say it's about, oh gosh, I don't, I don't even know to say it in a sort of luxurious terms. My thing is thinking of a walnut right now. <laughs> a walnut. That's about the size I of see. it. It's, 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 it's very, it's very large. And, and, and tell, yeah, tell us about I, it. I would say that was just a natural transgression. I mean, my father's passion, one of his first passions in June was his fascination with the black diamond. And so it was just such an obvious, you know, so obvious for him to, to, to the second he saw this sort of fall in love with it and, um, he he bought it and then he spent I think they spent a year deciding how to cut it and how how, how to best you know bring out you know its beauty. Although it's different to the white diamond where you know you have to think of the brilliance and the scintillation and all this. It's it's the black diamond is actually extremely tricky tricky to cut because obviously it's actually got more more inclusion. So it's it's harder. You know you have to be very careful of the lines you cut across and how you cut it. So yeah, they um, turned it into a mogul mogul uh shape diamond and it's um it's incredible i mean it unfortunately or fortunately he, he sold it so i haven't seen it in years and i my memory of it is this sort of but, but through photographs and everything it's an exceptional piece yes. and one of his first sort of big purchases yeah when i was reading about it it seems uh, you know the, the the way the the internet has described it rather mysterious whether or not it's been sold or and what it is. So the controversy with regard to a black diamond, uh, give us a little bit of an understanding for those who are not you know, particularly in it. Why was the black diamond such an issue? Well, I mean, because obviously, it's, I mean, essentially, like, what's, when we think of diamonds, so what do we think? Well, when we want to think of the most beautiful diamond, we think of, uh, the, you know, flawless. We think white. We think, you know, brilliance. We think... So it was kind of just kind of goes completely opposite to, to 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 what people think when they think of diamonds, and so it takes a kind of different mindset when you have to think about. It. I think my father just saw it in a very different way. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just I think it's just it just took that. That's why really people thought, okay, diamond is pure, a diamond is flawless, or di- you know, good diamond. So you know, it just it just it just took people a while to really you know. Yeah, so, use a disconnect. So it's very much the black swan. Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. So um, you guys well, and and you, Violetta, are in the luxury space, and you know, from anything I read from the outside, the luxury market is is doing very well. How do you describe how the luxury business is going? Um, yeah, I agree. It is doing very well, and it seems to sort of 
you know, the very high end anyway, seems to sort of not be affected by what goes on in the world somehow. Um, obviously to a certain degree, but but given that, you know, we make very, very expensive pieces and these incredible pieces and they still continue, you know, to sell and do well. And I think people that are of a certain world, you know, take, you know, I guess to get away or to get their minds off, you know, they have a true passion for these pieces and they still find somehow, you know, that <laughs> they, they, they still spend on these luxury, luxury items. Yeah, you as you, as you and I discussed uh, on stage in London last week, the your average selling price is fifty thousand pounds. Yes, I mean it's hard to say because there is such a range, but yeah, I would say the average is fifty thousand. We we start at you know we have th- these really cool um, younger pieces like the Allegra ring, which is the piece that was actually named after my sister, and I would say is the piece that's done the best. It's it's a really cool um, just a gold ring with um, uh, different like lots of bands on it and that starts at sort of 7,000 but then we go up to you know the hundreds of thousands so but I would say the average that was all going to piece yeah I would say is 50,000. Hmm. And all right so you know as you know one of the things that I, I do is I work with a, a number of luxury companies and I have talked to them about this thing this digital thing and let's say that the the overriding belief has been that digital and luxury don't go together well because digital is democratic, digital is transparency, digital is the cheapest price, digital is disruption. How have you approached digital? Because I know you guys have done quite a different approach. How do you describe the importance of digital in your strategy? Well, for us... Oh, sorry. I think. Well, first, I mean, uh, digital is. I mean, yeah, exactly. It took on. It took the the industry, especially the luxury market, to, to a time to sort of you know um, take on to the idea. And I think now, though, people are realizing that it's just a natural transgression. I think the clients of the future are the millennials. Um, they are, you know, that's they are digital. I mean, natives. That that's the way you know that that they think that's the way that they make their purchasing decisions that's the way so um yeah i think digital for, for luxury is 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 just like in life i think you know digital we have to be in digital because that's just the way everything is done now whereas you know 10 years ago it was still a question mark it was still like you know are our customers even using this you know and 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 all the brands you know all the luxury brands were very fearful to to to, to start and, and to be honest we we were we were too mm-hmm. me maybe less but, but the um some people in the company were too and i respect that i understand that you know it, it is a scary thought because luxury is supposed to be you know not attainable to everyone it's supposed to be you know and it's that social media digital is completely open to the world. So it's something very tricky. And I, you know, we're still learning on how to get it completely right. Mm-hmm. But well, you talked about the younger generation, but if you're talking 50K and uh, this type of luxury positioning, typically we're not selling to, I mean, there are the occasional Zuckerbergs of the world, but the majority of your clients are presumably not sort of still Gen, Gen Y or Gen Zs. They're typically more wealthier, older individuals. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, that I mean, more for the future, but now exactly, yeah, they are. I would say, you know, many of them are 40s and their 50s, but them as well. I mean, it's 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 really the way that people live through their social media. I mean, we have clients all the time coming in with their phones saying, oh, I've seen this uh, on Instagram or this blogger posted this or, you know, can we see this? I mean, it's really amazing what any age group really is using um, social social media, so it's yeah, it, you're right. Even even if they're even fifty sixty, I mean, yeah. everyone uses that. I think it's just the way of life. Uh, one of the things that's a challenge for luxury brands and digital is that you're going to have to sort through the wheat and the chaff because. So many of the people who are, you know, and ask, you know, luxury equals aspiration. And so if you're out there, then you're going to get a lot of traffic from people says, oh, isn't that pretty? But, you know, they absolutely don't have the wherewithal to purchase it. So you have the aspirational, lots of people liking it, but they're not at all customers. So have you have you sort of tried to figure out an approach through that or you just sort of are comfortable with the knowledge that, 98% of the people who are maybe liking your photograph are not necessarily customers. How do you approach that? 
So I think, I think, yeah, exactly. We have to sort of, you know, understand that a lot of the people on there are at the aspirational. But I think we try and sort of see the positive in that, in that the aspirational are the ones that create this buzz that then makes the real clients feel special, really. Because if you don't have those people, then, you know, if I buy something, you know, like a really nice watch, and then online I see everyone saying, oh, my God, that's so amazing, that's so cool, I wish I could have that, that kind of gives me an ego boost as well. So in that sense, yeah, I think it's 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 actually a good thing. And I think if we create good content um, that can then be shared and people share that content, we can control that in some way mm-hmm. and people are commenting on this, then I think, you know, we're happy. We obviously hope to, you know, through the content we create and through the influences we uh, reach out and have relationships with, that just the natural, the, the, the way it organically spreads the message, it, it spreads to the right people that would appreciate this type of thing. So the taste of someone that maybe can't afford it, but that they have good taste, then, that, then that's fine. We just don't want it to go and, you know, we wouldn't like it to be that like people that we don't really associate with who we would like to like our brand to start like liking it. But I think Mm -hmm. if we go about things in the correct way by reaching out and having relationships with the correct influences and having the right content, then organically it will spread to the right people. Mm. Well, you mentioned influencers and I just wanted to take a little break to identify my great sponsors, the first pioneer sponsors of this podcast, because I know you guys work with Tracker. And uh, and so I wanted to just uh, talk a little bit about them because they are kind enough to to sponsor me, and they're a really interesting platform. So what the, what is Tracker? Well, it's an influencer relationship management platform that helps brands like yourselves to plan and execute their influencer program end-to-end. Tracker, yeah. Tracker helps identify key influencers in your sector, monitor in real time the activity to optimize the brand's engagement, measure the impact and the relationship that you have with these influencers over, over time. And Tracker works with leading global brands across a lot of sectors, including luxury, just like yourselves, the Grosagomna, beauty and the fashion world, which, of course, are areas that I know so well. They've got offices in the U.S. and in Europe and are available in 11 languages, and they work with your famous self. So I wanted to um, just come back to uh, what you mentioned before, which is content, because if you're talking a digital strategy, you've clearly gotten a grip on this content side. How do you, how do you sort of craft your content strategy? Well, so now we actually want to do more um, um, because talking about influencers, I think, you know, it's very important that you have um, content that they will want to share. And if you don't have, you know, content that they they want to share, then it's almost, you know, pointless. So definitely working with influencers to create the content is one thing. And then um, also just creating content that's authentic and understanding the difference between, um, you know, the digital sort of like um, Instagram, for example, rather than our online or advertising campaigns, you know, to, it's very different. So Instagram, we try and be very authentic. It's very real. It's very in the moment. We don't do food. We don't go to, we, we don't like to do like professional photo shoots for Instagram, for example. And I find that people appreciate that. And that's, I think we have very good engagement because of that, because it's very, it's very real. Hmm. Well, so on the one hand, you have the benefit of of basically overtaking a photograph of your father yourself out with some um, shining examples of good customers. So that's automatic content. But this notion of of not taking professional photographers, I mean, that is almost anathema to the number of luxury brands that we can typically imagine where they want to retouch until the nth degree because perfection and luxury go together. Whereas... What I'm hearing from you is that it's not exactly the case. Yeah, and I think people, our followers, can see through that, you know. And I think doing that just kind of just takes away what uh, social social media is about, and that's not what, what people want to see. So, for example, in the magazines, the advertising campaigns, that's what they want to see. When they see a highly photoshopped hand in a studio setting – People are just like, okay, they want to see how to wear de Grisogna in real life. And we want to show people how to how to live de Grisogna, how to wear de Grisogna. We want to show, you know, that you can pair a really big ring with something quite casual that you can, you know. And it's just a, a, a fun way for us to firstly have fun and then just to show people really the spirit of de Grisogna and how it should be worn, how you can wear it and give people fun ideas. And also, you know, we are, a cool, we want to be a, a cool fun young brand as well as like 
portraying their amazing craftsmanship, which is something that we have to work on more. And I think that that's a great way to do it by just being really authentic and real. I don't know if you can tell us this, but did you have to persuade your father to allow for imperfect photographs? I mean, I don't mean to say your photographs are bad, but this notion of less less retouched, was that a discussion or was that sort of obvious for him? Actually, he's been really open to it. Very, his, his, you know, very, he sort of takes a step back and sort of just listens and, you know, just nods his head as like, mm, okay, but... He, I can, I can tell. Like now, he, he, he definitely appreciates and he likes the fact that that there are the way that we approach it compared to. Our, well, I don't want to talk about the rounds actually, but the way right. that we approach it is um, is is very Dickerzogano, and and people that follow us realize that that's real life. And if we have you know a studio shots on our Instagram, it's just basically bringing what we're doing somewhere else onto. We're just copying, you know, advertising onto our. Uh, social media and that's just silly I think Mm. so when we talk about social media as we were mentioning before obviously it's sort of the land of everybody with 1.4 billion people on Facebook 3.2 well sorry 1.7 billion around the world who are on social media so how have you gone at social media because I mean the end of the day you could probably spend you and everybody in the team's time doing stuff on social media so you have to carve out an amount of time for some kind of purpose so how have you gone about approaching social media so um we think of social media as as trying to you know give another viewpoint um of our brand and trying to bring people sort of behind the scenes and um you know showing you know what, what what we who we really are and i think visually i think instagram is the best one so we've had a big focus on instagram and also facebook although facebook has you know, I think it, it's lagging a bit behind. I think for, for most brands, the engagement isn't. I think also because everyone's on their mobiles all the time, and Instagram is more mobile. So um, mm-hmm. that's our focus. I would say is Instagram, and um, also just very much um, engaging. We we really make an effort to answer everyone, um, all the questions about the pieces, um, any complaints. We 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 answer straight away, and then um, spending a lot of time influencer on influencer marketing so finding um people that have grown organically their following through a a strong interest that they have that's in line with de Grisogono mm. and um you know before even reaching out to them really sort of understanding who they are who they talk to what their likes are what their dislikes are and we've you know started reaching out to some of these so building building relationships and um uh, content, creating our own authentic content mm. through Instagram are our two focuses now. All right. So um, we, when we when we look at the uh, opportunities on the different sites, do you have a, an approach that's specific by by social media, or you you sort of try to repurpose as much as you can at going across? What well, across, across you know, different channels? Yeah, or? taking taking an image and then making sure it's on Pinterest, Instagram. You pop it on a tweet. Uh, do you do that kind of a thing, or do you basically have a an approach specific to each platform? We try to have an approach specific to each platform. So, um, uh, Twitter we use more to to respond and to retweets and, and things like this. Instagram is more visual; these authentic images, and then Facebook copies Instagram. And then also, you know, if we have some fun stories or or events, then we'll put sort of a whole album on there. Um, you know to give people access almost to what you know a press release would give access to um, and also you know fun press articles that come out what we'll, we'll show on Facebook but Instagram is the main is the one that we do all the sort of content or the visual um, sort of that I basically take myself lifestyle um, sort of lifestyle fashion looks so what all right so I want to get in the mind of Violetta a second I mean so you're at Cannes or you're at some f- great activity you take a take a shot with your iphone i'm going to guess uh, and then you know you pop it up instagram and you're publishing it that evening or do you need to you know get some approvals and or do you wait until tomorrow to make sure that the lighting was appropriate or there's not no brands in the background you didn't want and that kind of stuff or how do you how do you go about that so during live during events we tend to just just go 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 and there's no 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 approval and there's sort of just some monitoring so if something's wrong then then we will take it down or you know for example also for snapchats or periscope you know that's obviously completely live so 
um, we've had some fun um, using Snapchat for events like Can. Um, it was a way for us to really involve our followers to come with us to the event completely live. Um, and that was just very real. Whatever they saw was was what it what, what the event was. Um, and then in terms of you know the lifestyle shots, so not event based, then there is some sort of approval usually. Um, but it, we're a very small team. It's it's very nice the way the way we work. We're, we're you know I work directly with the marketing um, director general Claire. Uh, and um, so it's basically just and Anne Henri, who's the heads of digital, and we we just three of us. We're basically very 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 fast. It's not like a long process or anything, and it's based on you know what 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 I post isn't also it's not, it's not too contrived. It's not too it's it's just very much you know you know sometimes what I'm wearing that day or you know what I think you know looks cool or like in line with sort of what's in fashion at the moment or mix and match. It's it's not too planned. Well, and this is what I thought was so remarkable about, you know, the fact that you're incarnating it, obviously, the founder's daughter, you know, is, and this is something I asked you last week, can you, can you outsource you? Um, I think so. I mean, I, what, what, what I really um, sort of, I guess, I guess, bring is, is, is obviously, you know, this, this love and understanding of the brand. And I think that through influencer marketing and through working with people, that that we believe have similar you know that are in line with our brand in, in in what in what they like and their passions and their followers and we you know create really strong relationships with them i think yeah we can do that in time we can do that so tell us about your influencer strategy because you guys have obviously pioneered doing a lot of great work in this naturally you're working with tracker but really how do you describe the your strategy with regard to influencers so um, we, um, well, firstly, track is hugely helpful. That really helps us um, sort of organize everything and also to helps us find um, these influences based on our interests and their interests and seeing, being able to monitor what they're saying, what they're talking about, who they're, who they're talking about and who they're being influenced by as well, which is, is very mm-hmm. interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, we, um, we basically choose to work with very few, but really having, um, you know, a perfect alignment between, you know, our styles and our thoughts and our um, likes and dislikes. And I think that's really important. So there's a lot of time spent, um, you know, researching um, depending on the country. So each each country, there are a few that we want to, to work with. And... Um, Basically, it also depends on the context. So, for example, if we have, for example, a launch of a uh, a piece of jewellery that's maybe more fun and fashionable, not so expensive, then we'll know, okay, this person will be perfect for that and their followers will love that and therefore the message will be, you know, will maximise everything. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, if instead we're doing sort of a high jewellery event, then this person who's maybe got far fewer followers, but who's a real specialist in jewellery and high fine jewellery and her followers are also very interested in, in, you know, more the craftsmanships and the techniques, then, you know, we'll we'll ask this person to help us. And I think that's really important rather than, you know, for just going for the, because I mean, in the, in the, this world, a lot of the fashion bloggers are also interesting for jewellery brands and they have huge followings. Like some of them have millions, but in the context of like a high jewellery show or exhibition, for example, that wouldn't be as interesting because their followers would be less sort of less interested and have a not, not, not so much of an appreciation for it. So I think we really just try and align, um, our communication to, to, to influences that, that are, you know, really well matched with, with, with our brand. And that just takes a lot of research and time and commitment and tracker helps a lot with that. Yeah. Yeah. The way you described it, you did a lot of listening before you plunged into it before. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we, um, we, we, we find them, you know, through following them, reading their blogs, seeing, you know, w- what they're writing about, who they're working with, and then um, seeing what, what they're talking about you know what what they're saying and who they're talking to and who they're being influenced by and that allows us to also um you know when we reach out to them it makes us much more interesting to them and and vice versa so you know if we know a blogger for example has a love of amethysts and and we've got this great collection you know we'll approach them and she'll be so interested in it she'll be so much more excited to work about i think that's i think it's about finding the excitement and the fun in it and i think just going to anyone because they've got a large following 
um it's just and i th- i think the, the followers as well they, they they see right through that you know we want the followers not to be like what is yeah. well, this what, girl what showing us this is nothing that? to do with her style yeah. you know and so you mentioned before that you look by country or at least by zone so first of all do you do any influencer marketing with non-english speaking and two do you find that uh, the, some of the markets are different in the way that they are influential. You, you know what I mean? Are, are you looking for, you know, sometimes it, you know, the, the cultural aspect is so radically different. It sort of surprises you. Yeah, I think to a certain degree, I think, um, I think, I mean, a lot of our, the influences are talk, you know, English. So a lot of it is done in English. Um, but then there are certain countries, for example, Italy, Italy, you know, they're, they're far more, I don't know the word in English, actually. They're like you say it in Italian, maybe so. Provinciali. I mean, they're, 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 I mean you know, you know that they're, they're almost. And I love it. I love Italy. I mean, I'm half Italian. I mean, I'm, I'm Italian, um, and it's sort of that. You know that they, they travel. All the bloggers they they still travel, and the very big ones. But a lot of them are sort of just famous within Italy, and we love that. So if we do something in Italy, we'll just do something more, you know, more local, and we'll just reach out to them. Um, and then yeah, they, they are different depending on, on the cultures. I mean, we want to do more with you know sort of the Asia and stuff, and that will be that 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 will be completely different. I mean, culturally, it's just mm-hmm. just a completely different mindset. But um, what I find is that these bloggers, the very big ones travel so much they all know each other so it's yeah. almost like a learned it's a learned trade so that so so they all they're all very similar in 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 how they you know approach things and then and how they view things and stuff especially in the fashion world because they're so i mean literally if you go to um a, a big brands event it will always be the same 50 big bloggers whichever country they're from well so then you have uh, I, i'm going to have to imagine a number of situations where if you give one of them something you know because you're you like a friendship you you deal with people differently so these are relationships you're cultivating but you know if they're all together and you might have given a nice little privilege perk to one but not to the other <laughs> does that sort of is that something that comes up regularly i mean that is hard because also the fact that yes they i mean they all know each other um and you have to i i think it's you know just we haven't had that problem because being a jewelry brand we don't we don't tend to um to gift uh, things it's more our gift i would say is is more well not a gift but we we believe that it's mutual sort of it's, it's something mutual that they can come to for example to can to our terrace and spend the day with us and have drinks on our terrace they can for example we offered uh bloggers um during the Cannes film festival to come and to use our um, equipment uh, to create uh, videos and um, on on the terrace and show their followers where they were and everything. So we offer these sorts of things, I, I guess. We don't offer gifts, but yeah, we have to be careful. But it's based on the relationship. It's based on you know, like if we're closer with someone, then you know, then obviously we're going to do more things for them. And I think that's fine. That's just like in real life, and that's how it should. I I, I don't think um, I think it would be a problem if we if we were a, a fashion brand and we gave you know something to 10 of them we would you would have to give it to all of them i think <laughs> and then i think there's much to be said to having a, a manageable number of bloggers too or you know or influencers because you know if you start industrializing it then you inevitably have to put in place processes well these these people have between five and ten thousand we should give them you know access to this item or this activity or this experience and then if there are 10 to 50 then this this and you end up creating this sort of fictitious sets that you you have to do in order, in order to keep some of your head together. But in your case, you guys have a smaller group that you personally oversee, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think that that's, I think that's the way it should be. I think that's what makes, I think that's the beauty of influencer marketing. You know, they're these real relationships and, you know, you, you they're based on, you know, real um a real liking for each other for each other and a mutual love for something and i think you know you can't have that with so many people you know i think it's nice to really choose and pick and then you don't have the problems of you know the ones ones like these you know having to please hundreds and hundreds of people it just becomes a bit fake i think Mm -hmm. so so true so um you've been doing this for uh this influencer marketing now for a couple of years um, yeah, we've been really concentrating on it for, um, I would say, a year, a year and a half. Before that, it was almost, I found it anyway, like, 
well, Trump has helped a lot in a sense because initially it was quite, it's quite overwhelming. There are so, so, so many sure. of these influences. I mean, it's really, really crazy, especially women's fashion or yeah. women's accessories, jewelry. I mean, Beauty. it's really, so it's very overwhelming. So initially it was sort of just sort of researching, just finding these really big ones and thinking, okay, let's reach out to them and send them a press release and not really understanding how to go about it. Mm-hmm. And then it was sort of taking a step back and taking a different perspective and realizing, okay, let's take our time. Let's really understand um you know what's going on who's who what they're saying and, and just realizing we don't have to rush into it you know let's just take our time and, and that's what we've been doing in the last year and a half so yeah although we've been doing it for longer i think we started off on on the on the, on the wrong foot like mm-hmm. like many like many sure. did yeah, yeah well it's interesting you know the word time and luxury also have to go together because there's like this notion of timelessness and then you know luxury is time if you have time on your hands and so there's that moment of exclusivity but then on the other hand this is like real time it's flash it's uploaded it's dig dig bag news quick in action yeah so that's the kind of world you're living in so violetta i i want to thank you because i know uh time is of the essence as we were just saying and uh so i want to thank you for coming on the show and ask what would be the best way for someone to follow you or get in touch with you should you wish um, thank you, firstly. It was great talking about um, everything with you. Um, the best way um, through Twitter, um, Violetta uh, Grossi, uh, spelled, G- spelled out as well, G-R-U-O-S-I. Um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, that's the best way. I would love to hear anyone's thoughts or any questions. It'd be great. Well, I'll put the links in the show, show notes. And lovely having you on the show. Be in touch. Brilliant, for sure. Thank you very much. Thanks for having listened to this recording of The Minter Dialogue Show. You'll find the show notes on themindset.com, that's mindset with a Y, where you can also sign up for my weekly newsletter at forward slash subscribe. If you like the show, please do rate it in iTunes. That really makes my day. Happy trails and enjoy Josh Sachs's Painted Fingers. Oh, Phil. Ugly